people, we have to talk. There is an invisible elephant in the room, and Magalimi Berg is going to tell us about it. Have fun. Hello. So I'm going to begin with a little story. Sorry, I'm just... Yeah, okay. So I'm going to start with a little story. Um, a few, well, months ago now, I was at a um, web accessibility event with a lot of other professionals of the field, and we were talking about ac web accessibility, disability, um, all that. We were at the speaker diner, and we were having a lot of fun, sharing a lot of interesting facts about disability and so on. And so, during the evening, I had said multiple times that I was disabled and talked a little bit about my own experiences. At some point at the, in the evening, like it usually happens, everyone got very loud because everyone was very happy to be here. And one of the women at the tab table, she said she had trouble following what was being said because of the noise. And I said that it was the same for me because my brains and all that. And another woman turned to me and said, but imagine what it should be for disabled people. And I was like, what? So I didn't really understand what was happening because, well, I had been very clear about the fact that I was myself disabled. Uh, this woman seemed very nice. She was very, very passionate about accessibility. But during the evening, she had said a couple of things that made me think she didn't really know disabled people. So I didn't want to make a scene, so I just ended up saying something like, but I'm disabled, so? With a question in mark at the end and a feeble voice that really annoyed my, me. The thing is... Um, I don't fit into the stereotype of disabled people. I don't use a wheelchair, I don't have a cane, and my disability is basically invisible. When you see me, you might think woman or fat or loud, which I can be, but not disabled. So even when I talk about it, a lot of people just forget that I'm disabled. This is what invisibil invisible disability is. Well, today, I think you're not going to forget I am disabled because I'm going to talk a lot about it. I'm going to talk about disability. I'm not going to talk about web accessibility or accessibility in general. Um, this is a very interesting topic, but this is not mine today. Today, I'm going to, take, to talk about what is disability, what means being disabled, and what our industry could do better about the inclusion of disabled workers, which is a lot. We have a lot of work to do. Um, my, this is my experiences, the experiences of a lot of people I know, but what I'm going to say today is not the experiences of everyone. Don't forget throughout the talk that disability is a very vast domain. It's a very, it's a huge group of very different people with different needs. So I may say some stuff that is not true for everyone that is disabled. That's okay, don't forget that we all have different experiences. So now you should have guessed that I'm French. <laughs> Sorry for the accent. Um, we. There is a lot of stereotypes about French people. One of the truest is, a, is probably the one about how we are bad at languages. So when I was about 16, I decided that my school didn't do enough to make me fluent in English, and improvised a method of learning that relied on me reading Stephen King and Jane Austen and watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer, so 20 plus years later, I still have a very weird English. So I'm going to mix up 90s California slang with 88th century expression. So don't be too surprised by that. It happens. 20 years didn't 
correct everything. Other than that, I am. I used to be a social worker before I, I got into tech. I've been a tech worker for around four years now. Um, I am also, I don't remember what I am, it seems. Uh, I am also uh, LGBTQA+, I am disabled, I am neurodivergent. Um, I am also a feminist, I am an activist, and I am an advocate for uh, more diversity and inclusion in tech in particular, but in the world in general. I also am a huge pet lover, I love my dogs. I talk about them all the time, I'm very annoying, which means I even talk about them when it's not relevant at all, like at this moment. Talking about my dogs, I'm going by to buy a little bit of your sympathy uh, by showing them to you. It's going to center me a little bit. The big one is plume, it means feather. The small one is truffa, it means truffle. Right now, they're probably annoying my roommate because he's the only one at home and they're going to be very, very angry at me in a couple of days when I'm going home. But right now, they give me a little bit of courage, so bask into the cuteness and I'm going to take a breath before we embark on our journey. Okay, I'm going to ask you to participate a little bit. Promise, I'm I'm still going to be the one that does all the job, all the work, sorry. Um, please raise your hand if you have a disabled person as a colleague in your team. Okay, thank you. Please raise your, your hand if you never worked with someone disabled in your team, if it never happened to you. Good, okay, thank you. Well. Chances are, even if you raised your hand at the second question, that you actually did, because 20, around 20% 20 of the population is disabled, one in five percent, uh, and 80% of those disabled people are invisible, which means that most of the time we are talking to disabled people without even knowing it. A lot of us, don't talk about our disability. I used to don't talk about it when I could manage perfectly uh, because there is a lot of stigma around disability, a lot of biases, and we face discrimination, which I'm going to talk about later. So most of the time, we act like we are valid where we are actually disabled. I actually, myself, had colleagues that I found out later they were disabled because while being at work, they couldn't talk about it. What is disability is a question that is kind of hard to answer. Um, if I tried to list all the disabilities that exist, we would be there tomorrow, I guess, uh, still. So I'm not going to <laughs> do that. Um, even if I try to focus on one type of disability, it's still a huge group of people. For example, I told you I was neurodivergent. If I try to focus on neurodivergence, oh, sorry, I was too. I already have a long list of di very different disabilities. That is not even all that is neurodivergence. Yeah, there are others. And as you can see, it's um, a lot of very different experiences and needs, because if you like talk to someone that has, let's say, ADHD, or someone that has epilepsy, you don't have the same needs, you don't have the same experiences at all. So when we talk about disability, we really talk about so many different things that it's hard to really um, vision what it means. Also, our, um, our um, idea of disability is really far from the reality. 
For example, when I say disability, most of people think about wheelchairs. This is the example I'm going to use a lot of this during this talk because this is the example that we can all kind of agree on. But only 5% of people, of disabled people, use a wheelchair. So it's kind of the symbol of disability, but it's one of the less um, frequent disability. Also, what is very important to remember is that more than half of disabled people have more than one disability. Disability is not one thing, most of the time it's multiple things. If you have to remember three things from this talk, I'd like you to remember those. So please be very focused. After that, you can just stop listening to me, it's okay. So, first, anyone can be disabled. You don't know by looking at someone if, it, if that person is disabled or not. Sometimes you do, but most of the time you don't. 80% of disability is invisible. It means that even talking, living with someone, sometimes you can't see their disability. Second, not everyone is born with it. This is a usual misconception about disability. We always think about people that were born with it, and learned to adapt, and blah, blah, blah. Well, most of us actually became disabled later in life. Or some of us are born with one disability and then get some other ones later in life. So it's not something that you know when you meet a newborn, it's something that you can experience at any time. And that's, that one is my own, but it should be disabilities and not disability. This is that idea that it's not one experience, it's like thousands and thousands of different experiences. So it's very hard to all group them under one idea. For me, also, it's disabilities and not disability. I'm part of the 57% of people that have more than one disability. So, uh, basically, um, I used to have, I have severe asthma, I have chronic migraines, I have CPTSD, and three years ago, I got long COVID. I don't know if you all know, but long COVID is a illness that you get sometimes when you have had COVID. Myself, um, I've been suffering from it for three years. Um, long COVID is a very impactful disability for me. It's the most impactful these days. It totally changed my life. I thought I had it under control, all the other stuff I had, and I had long COVID, and I had to just try again <laughs> back to the beginning. Um, long COVID is a complicated illness for two reasons. First, it's kind of new, so we don't know a lot about it. Some people have it for a few months and it's gone. Some people like me have it for years and it seems to want to stay. Um, and second, it's a very <laughs> large dis um, illness that has very different symptoms, like a lot of people have respiratory issues. This is not my case, which is good, because with the asthma it would have been awful. Uh, me, I'm on the neurological side, which means I have chronic fatigue, which means at my best I'm exhausted. I have pain everywhere, and I also have cognitive issues, what we call brain fog, which means that I need my notes when I do a talk, because at any moment I can lose totally uh, what my brain was doing at its moment. Um, this is a diff difficult balance to find with long COVID because there is no help, basically. Uh, the only thing um, they say you to do is to rest. So 
I mean, I'm a 36-year-old woman that needs to work, so resting all day is not possible. So I have to find the balance between choosing what I want to put my energy into and what I have to just stop doing. Sorry. Sorry, I have a up. Okay. So Ah, yes, it works. Um another survey. Do you think people using a wheelchair we're going to use that example for no one, but of course it's not every disability with a wheelchair, like I said. Do you think people using a wheelchairs can work in tech? Please raise your hands if you think it's not an issue for working in tech. Okay, thank you. No. Please keep your hand raised if your workplace has no steps or ramps. When well, yeah, there are steps, of course. If there is no small spaces that a wheelchair can't um, access, and everything is reachable for someone in a wheelchair, like, you know, coffee break stuff, can they uh, get to the cookies and all that stuff? Yes, okay. Now, what about the restaurants you go to with your team? Or the event? I see there is one hand raised. <laughs> I like it, thank you. <laughs> so you know, okay. Thank you. So th that's the point, basically, that we kind of all agree in theory that wheelchair users should be able to work in tech, except most of our work workplaces are not wheelchair accessible. So when, when we say, yes, of course, disabled people are welcome in our industry, but we do nothing to um, make uh, the environment friendly to uh, people in wheelchairs, for example, then we are part of the issue also. And of course, disability is not just wheelchairs, so we have to work on everything because making something wheelchair friendly doesn't mean it's blind friendly, for example, or sometimes it's even worse because sometimes making something wheelchair friendly makes another obstacle for people that are blind, for example, so we have to work around all these issues, and it's not easy. I'm not, my talk is not about how easy it is to be inclusive, that would be lying. When I got long COVID and I realized it was going to stay, I thought I was very lucky because I was in tech, um, if it had happened when I was a social worker, I would have just not been able to work at all. So I thought, okay, so I'm in tech, we have money, we, have, uh, we can work from home, we can, uh, uh, nothing about long COVID um, makes me unable to work in tech, so that's going to be okay. Well, I was a little bit optimistic, it seems, because um, it has been kind of hard these past three years. Um, for work, I need only, let's say, two accommodations. First one is I need to be full remote, because public transportation <laughs> is kind of a Russian roulette for me. Uh, sometimes 15 minutes of, bus, of a bus ride means I have to sleep the afternoon off, or sometimes even take two days to recuperate, so it's just not doable. And I need to sometimes, not always, but sometimes, have some flexibility about my rhythm of work, because sometimes, suddenly, I'm not able to do anything, and I need to rest, so sometimes, let's say an afternoon, I have to rest and I will be able to work either in the evening or more um, the, the, the day, uh, tomorrow day, let's say. I don't find the word. Um, so I can't be in a rigid uh, nine to five setup. 
uh, when I began doing interviews and all that and saying that kind of stuff, uh, I saw that it scared the employers a lot. And like the naive kind of girl I was, I thought, yeah, okay, so I'm going to explain to them that it's because of disability. So I did. And then the conversations just stopped. When you say you have a disability, most people think you're going to be lazy, incompetent, or you're going to be just too costly for the, um, uh, for, for your, the workplace. So, the, the idea that disabled people can't work, uh, won't work, are, not, are lazy or, or that, um, is an ableist idea. Um, ableism is basically to kind of um, make it simpler. Uh, ableism is the idea that valid people are better than disabled people, that disabled people are less than valid people. Uh, it can be sometimes benevolent. Not every ableism, ableism is um, unkind. Some people don't have to hate um, disabled people to be ableist. A few weeks ago, I was working for, on a project for like two, two years with people. And a few weeks ago, I just told them that I needed a little bit of adjustment about how my time was spent. And they basically fired me, saying to me that they didn't want me to be too tired. And they didn't want me to um, say I was going to, to do something and not be able to do it, and all that kind of stuff. They really thought they were doing me a kindness by choosing for me, which was actually horrible because I'm an adult. I know what I can and cannot do and I had given no reason to doubt me like they did. So that is benevolent ablaze. The idea that disabled people are not really adults and you have to choose for them, you know better than them. Um, wheelchair users have a lot of story about how valid people sometimes help them when they say no and hurt them or break their wheelchair by trying to help them by force. Uh, that's benevolent ableism. People think they are doing a good thing where they're actually being um, violent towards uh, disabled people. So, do disabled people work? Yes, we do. Uh, we often do it in worst settings that valid people because we often have to accept stuff that valid people can afford to say no to. We also are poorer most of the time because we don't have access to good jobs. Some disabled people don't work, and that's okay. I'm not saying that any uh, disabled people should work. Some people <laughs> spend half their day just like taking a shower and being able to live. Uh, I'd say they already have a job, it's their disability. But for disabled people that can work, that need to work, that want to work sometimes, um, there is a lot, a lot of discrimination. And we, um, numbers are pretty much the same all around Europe. It's around, disabled people are twice as much unemployed as valid people. So when you are disabled, this is why you don't tell it at work, because you know that most of the time you're not going to be uh, hired, or even you're going to be fired very easily. Yeah, um, Justice is supposed to be blind, she is disabled and she's supposed to be on our side, in Europe anyways. Uh, in Europe, most countries have uh, anti-discrimination laws. So when I say we are discriminated, uh, a lot of people tell me, yeah, but there are laws, they can't do that. Well, the issue with discrimination is that 
you can't prove it most of the time. Um, they are not um, stupid enough to send you an email saying, I don't hire you because you are disabled, so you can't prove it. It's really hard to prove it. And so um, in France, for example, we have quotas, which means um, big corporations have to have a percentage of disabled people in their um, in their teams, but most most um, most uh, corporations um, pay the fine. They prefer to pay the fine than to hire disabled people. Uh, when I was a social worker, I did an internship in a in a place that uh, took care of minors that had issue with the justice. So we were under the justice department. And this year, um, that year, um, the justice department of France had to pay near 1 million euros of fine because they didn't have any disabled people in their uh, employees. Uh, it made a huge scandal at the time because it was really a huge fine, uh, but it's still the same thing. <laughs> So that's the reality. Uh, in reality, um, disabled people face discrimination, like I said. We face a lack of accessibility. How do you work at a place where nothing is accessible? How do you go to work when public transport isn't accessible either? And how do you work when the tools used by your team are not accessible? Um, I talk a lot with disabled people because of this talk I, I began a, a huge conversation about this and I have multiple stories of people that were hired by a company and then just it wasn't possible because everything was against them into um, going to work, then at work, then out of work, the tools, etc., etc. So this lack of accessibility is a huge problem. Some of it is not because of the tech industry, like my streets are not accessible, it's not the tech fault. But um, what happens into, um, in the companies is our responsibilities. Also, we face a lack of representation, we never talk about disabled people, we never show disabled people anywhere, which means when we arrive in a company for an interview, we are seen as aliens. People just don't know what to do with us, what to ask from us, to us. So it's, it means the communication doesn't happen and most people are kind of scared and are like, oh, I don't know how to deal with it, so no, it's not going to be possible. It is discrimination, it's not good, but it's also kind of understandable. If we don't know how to interact with someone, if we don't know how to help someone have his, it, their, need meets, their needs meet, met, sorry, you, don't, you can't imagine this person into the company. As I said, um, I used to think that in tech we were better than other industries. Um, I didn't imagine that we could be anything that better. Um, the truth is, and this is a moment where sometimes people are angry with me, but the truth is, as, a, as an industry, we have a kind of closed-minded culture. We are very into a culture that is adapted to one type of person, the dominant type of person in the industry, which is valid people, of course, but is also mostly men, of course. So a lot of us don't even try to reframe our um, culture in our industry. Like, for example, when I was looking for a job, a lot of the job ads we are talking about how, yeah, the team goes running every Tuesday. Or 
We have a soccer team, and it's great. I mean, I'm not against sports, it's great. But at some point, you realize that it's not just something bonus that you can skip. It's everything about team building that is done around sports or outdoor events or that kind of stuff. Um, at some point in France, there was a trend that was running interviews. Like, I was like, running? I'd rather die, but also I could die, so <laughs> no thank you. This is a real issue because it's ki it seems kind of reasonable to want to share the same culture as a team, but the truth is, <laughs> it isn't. It's not reasonable if it means that someone that is outside this culture can't go in. Then it's discrimination. As a dev, I need to be able to do code and all, and all that. Nobody should care if I am fit physically, if I can go running on Tuesdays or not. I shouldn't have to justify it, except when I come into in, an interview in a team that is all about running and going outdoors and all that, I know I'm going to have to justify it. And they're probably going to think, well, I don't know if she's not going to fit in uh, the culture. She can't go uh, running with us. She can go on outings and all that. Except this is not my work. My work is doing code. We can bond as a team around other stuff. I'm not saying we have to stop sports and all that for bonding, bonding uh, exercise. I'm saying we should open up to other stuff also, because otherwise we're just being discriminating. This is the last one. After that, you're going to be able to rest. Know that we know each other, we trust each other. Please raise your hand if you think about disabled people when you organize a tech event like Meetup, etc. Okay, but well, maybe you don't um, organize that. Ah, nice one, and thank you. Maybe you don't organize that kind of event. So, do you think about disabled people when you organize a party? Nice. Okay. And when you go out with friends, do you think about the disability issues? Yes, I'm going to go on a very instinctive stuff and think that people that raised their hand have friends with disabilities. Yes. You wear a lot, raising hands. Uh, most of the time, I, have, I don't have um, as much. Um, I know it's a kind of cliché, but where, when we talk about our disabilities our, as disabled people, uh, we only share, share the tip of the iceberg. Um, one of the hardest things about disability for me is how it isolates you, how it shrinks your world. Suddenly, I can't do what I used to be able to do, but also I can't go everywhere I used to be able to go. I have lost friends because they live far and I can't go see them, so after a few months, they just lose patience in me. I've lost hobbies because I can't go into, uh, I don't know, a knitting a group, uh, uh, every uh, Tuesday at nine, and because at nine I'm sleeping, so it's not possible. I've also lost a lot of work. All of that is heartbreaking, because little by little my world gets a little bit smaller, and I feel like I'm getting smaller also. We only share the tip of the iceberg, for example, today you see me on stage. I'm rocking the bad accent. I'm smiling, pretty badass. I seem full of energy. And you probably think that I have my disability uh, 
under control. This is <laughs> not true at all. I spent yesterday sleeping in my hotel room because I had a 12-hour journey in train to come here, and I just couldn't. I had to sleep. Tomorrow, I'm at another conference, and Saturday, I come home for 12 hours train also. And I already know that next week is going to be hell, that I am going to have to sleep it off like crazy. Um, also, I have 45 minutes of walk from my train station to my home in France. I have no idea how I'm going to do it, because clearly, after two talks in two different events, plus 12 hours of trains, I'm going to just be like a mess. <laughs> it's not going to be pretty. And that is something I don't talk a lot about. Well, today I am. <laughs> but usually, I don't talk about it. Usually, I do my stuff, and then I deal with it which means that people don't understand when I tell them, no, I can't go out tonight, I'm too tired, or that, or that kind of things, because my, what I live through, the hardest part of being disabled, is something that is hidden. Most of the time, because it involves a lot of intimate things, but also because I don't want to be always talking about how hard everything is to me. I also want to be able to just enjoy the moment. Enjoy the, this time, for example, being happy that Kandinsky uh, trusted me, wanted to hear my story and my voice, and then I'll deal with the rest later and try to not to think too much about it. When I wrote that... Um, talk. Oh, well, I was pretty fast today. When I wrote that talk, um, my aim was to educate a little bit people um, of the audience and try to begin thinking about how we can do better as an industry. Um, I kind of decided that there were three steps that we have to take. You, you're going to see it's not complicated steps, but in reality it's like a work of a lifetime, so don't be too happy about the si simple aspect of those uh, steps. First one is we edu educate ourselves. We can't deal with an issue if we don't understand it. So welcome to step one, because <laughs> that was what we did today. Um, even I, which I am disabled, I have disabled friends, I've been educating myself on these issues for years because I was even a professional of disability when I was a social worker, so you, you, could, you would think I have educated myself and it's okay, but step one is never finished. I discover things every day. I have to work against my biases every day. So step one is kind of step all the time. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is a very important step. And of course, I'm not saying everyone should be a specialist of disability. This is not our work. Well, it's kind of my work sometimes, but it's not everyone's work. Uh, but I think we should all have basic, uh, basic understanding of what disability is and what issues are about disability. I don't believe uh, we should be working in anywhere, actually, without understanding at least the basics about that. Step two, we change our practices. That's probably the hardest, because it goes against everything we want to do. As human beings, we want to be kind of lazy. We like our habit, habits. And we don't want to change our practices. It's work. It means we have to question what we are doing. It means 
we have to be uncomfortable. For example, I am very at risk for COVID, of course, um, and I have already had it twice, so I'm very, very, um, let's say, um, proactive <laughs> into protecting myself, so I'm still masking, I'm trying to social distance and all that. Uh, last week, at I was at a convention about disability, and there were a lot of deaf people. With my mask, they couldn't understand me, so I had to s remove my mask, which was something I did because I wanted to include them, and they had no other means because I can't uh, sign, so that's it. But it, was, it meant I had to take a risk about my health. Not every change is as risky than that. We don't have to risk our health every time, but sometimes it's that kind of balance of what do I want to do, what is more important to me, should I mask, should I mask, for example. So we found a compromise by trying to be the more outside possible and me without a mask. That's the complicated thing for step two, is that we have to change and we have to change again and again. Tomorrow you have, let's say, a blind person. I think. You have a, a blind person uh, in your team that arrives, so you change your practices. But like six months later, it's, let's say, a deaf person that comes in and suddenly what you did for the blind person might make it not accessible for the deaf person, so you have to change again. And the more you, you're going to be inclusive, the more complicated it's going to be. So I know I'm not really setting this point right now, but this is the truth. Being inclusive, whether it be disability, about disability or gender or anything, is not simple. I wish it was because it would be so easier to sell to people. <laughs> I would be like, okay, it's easier, you do that, 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 and it's okay. But the truth is, it's not easy, it's work, and you have to work at it again and again. And step three, we hire disabled people. Well, that seems kind of obvious, <laughs> I guess, but what I mean by that is we don't hire one person and it's okay. One person is an exception. Multiple person is diversity. So the idea is that if you want to be inclusive for disabled people, you want to work at it, so you educate yourself, which is already some work, then you uh, change your practices, which is another kind of work. And then you have no disabled pe people in your team. It's just time wasted. So you have to be proactive in hiring disabled people. The thing is, most companies don't do the job. So if you do the job in your team and you talk about it, then disabled people will come to you. I know in France, for example, I know a couple of companies that I have in my uh, site. Um, and then I, when people, disabled people tell me, well, I don't find job and all of that, I send them to those companies because I know they are inclusive. Um, that's really a good thing because disabled people bring experiences and ideas that most valid people don't have. For example, we, there is a lot of product that is um, launched that is not accessible because in the team there were no disabled people to say we have um, this issue or that issue. When you have disabled people in your team, most of the time, at least for their disability, you're going to be clear about what your product has or has not. So it is a richness, and it is kind of what we want to do with, uh, well, that's what I'm trying to convince you to do, so I guess this is the end of the pitch. 
I'm sorry, it was a little bit all over the place because I'm really, really, really tired. I hope I still was understandable. Um, I don't give uh, the slides because as you saw, there is nothing on it, just drawings. But if you scan the QR code that's here, you're going to find some resources if you want to keep at working on step one, so educating yourself. Um, I usually add stuff to these resources every time I, I find something new. Sometimes I remove stuff if it's not uh, there anymore, or if something has changed and, you, and all that. So come back to it like a few months uh, from now and you'll have new stuff too. Um, it is, there is my Twitter, my Mastodon. I'm also on Blue Sky, but I just arrived, so I don't remember my handle. Uh, but I guess it's something like Daisy Moon or Magal Milberg, something like that. Um, if you want to talk to me about this talk, I'll be there um, this afternoon. I don't know if I'll be there until the end because I'm really tired, as I said, so please try to find me uh, like sooner. Um, I won't be there tomorrow because I'm at another convention. So yeah, uh, if you don't find me, social media uh, is okay to continue to talk about it too. I hope it was okay. <laughs> I need to breathe. Um, and I thank you for coming uh, to this talk.